Hello everyone, my name is Wilson Tsai. I am the director of the Heartburn Center of California and today I would like to have a discussion about heartburn. Uh, in my personal opinion, I feel that heartburn in this country is uh, mostly misunderstood. I think partly because of the fact that there's so much emphasis on the chemical nature of heartburn and reflux rather than on the true cause of heartburn and reflux in this country. Uh, you see many commercials talking about medications that deacidify or decrease the acidity of the stomach, thereby decreasing the symptoms of heartburn. But unfortunately, in many patients, just simply decreasing the symptoms of heartburn may not be enough, primarily because of the fact that heartburn is only a symptom of the actual disease that we call gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, gastroesophageal reflux disease encompasses many different symptoms. Of course, the most typical one is basically heartburn, where people eat and they feel that hotness in their epigastric area or their lower chest area. Some people can actually feel food coming up into their esophagus, going up into their mouth. But there are other many, many other symptoms that people may not be aware of, which is directly related to gastroesophageal reflux disease that we also call GERD. Uh, so therefore, simply focusing on one symptom of the entire disease may not truly be adequate treatment for the problem that we all call heartburn. Some of the other symptoms that may manifest because of reflux is uh, pulmonary symptoms. People can have uh, shortness of breath, persistent coughing, persistent throat clearing. People's voices may change because of the con constant regurgitation of the contents of their stomach injuring or inflaming the lungs or the vocal cords. And many patients can actually present with pneumonias leading to significant shortness of breath. And so because of that, simply taking the medications that decrease the acidity of the stomach contents may not actually prevent the actual mechanical problems where the contents of the stomach are going up for these patients to be inhaling the contents into the lungs, injuring their vocal cords, and so on and so forth. Another major complication of reflux disorder, which is really not known by many physicians or in many patients in the country, is that gastroesophageal reflux disease is directly, directly related to the development of esophageal cancer. We know that people with heartburn and reflux have a significant uh, chance of developing what we call precancerous lesions or precancerous changes of the esophagus known as Barrett's esophagus. Now Barrett's esophagus encompasses a very wide spectrum of disease and of course there are many gradation, grades of Barrett's esophagus but most commonly we do know that Barrett's esophagus is significantly associated with a higher risk of developing esophageal cancer. Although that risk is low, but however, that risk is directly related to how bad the reflux is, how long the reflux has been going on, and of course, other certain factors that um, are beyond the scope of today's lecture. But more importantly, when we talk about reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease, I think it's most important to understand why you have the disease. And in many patients in this country, the most common reason why people have reflux is because of a hiatal hernia which is actually a mechanical problem uh, where there's a mechanical defect in your diaphragm. And I'm going to draw some pictures here to really sort of uh, explain uh, why people with hiatal hernias may develop reflux, which the scope of medications cannot really help or treat effectively. So in order to talk about a hiatal hernia or reflux, it's very important to talk about normal anatomy. And that normal anatomy is what basically establishes the natural mechanical barrier to prevent refluxate of stomach contents going into, your, going into your esophagus. So first off, we're going to draw what the normal anatomy looks like here. Here's a picture of your esophagus. Here's a picture of your stomach. Now, the esophagus is basically a tube in your body that connects your mouth to your stomach. So it allows a passage of food down into your stomach. It really plays a very minimal role in the role of digestion. What it does is basically contract in a very coordinated fashion called peristalsis and also secretes saliva to help lubricate the food so that way that food can go into your stomach. Now, in order for the esophagus to go from the mouth to the stomach, it basically has to pass through two major body cavities or, you know, in, your, in your body. Number one, the chest, and number two, the abdomen. And in order for it to pass from the chest into the abdomen, it has to pass through a structure called the diaphragm. Now, the diaphragm is something we know. It's a muscle that looks like a parachute. 
It separates your abdominal cavity from your chest cavity. And basically, there is an anatomical hole in the diaphragm which allows the passage of the esophagus to basically go through your chest. And that hole is called the diaphragmatic hiatus. Now, in order for us not to have reflux, there's a portion of the esophagus that we all call the lower esophageal sphincter, LES for short, that has to be intact. What does that intactness comprise of? Well, when people describe a sphincter, by the truest definition, the sphincter is a circular row of muscles that when it contracts, it closes the hole or the orifice. Now, in the lower esophageal sphincter, for example, in the esophagus, for example, that sphincter is not a true circular row of muscles. The lower esophageal sphincter doesn't act as a valve, as many, it's not a true valve as anyone ta uh, everyone calls it. It's basically a region of the esophagus that has a higher pressure associated with it than what's above it or below it. So, because of the fact that the lower esophagus or the lower esophageal sphincter has a higher pressure associated with it, and there's a lower pressure above it and a lower pressure below it, it prevents reflux from happening. So how does this happen? Well, in order for the lower esophageal sphincter to be intact or competent, there are several structural consistencies that have to be, that has to happen. Number one, the lower esophagus has to lie within the abdominal cavity. And in doing that, it increases the pressure of this part of the esophagus that's being exerted on than what's above it. Well, how does that work? So, in order to have reflux not happen, you have to have about four to six centimeters of the, of the uh, esophagus extend into the abdominal cavity. And the reason why is this. The abdomen always has a higher pressure than what's in the chest. The abdomen is basically comprises of very heavy organs, your liver, your spleen, your colon. These are heavy organs that exert an, a higher pressure inside the abdominal cavity. More importantly, the abdominal muscles, which are mostly in, in, in contraction, also increases that pressure around the uh, surrounding structures. Now in the chest, for example, the chest actually has what we call negative inspiratory pressure. So what that means, negative pressure. So what that means is the fact that when we breathe, the mechanics of respiration causes a negative force to pull the lungs open and so that negative force is translated as a lower pressure which is exerted around the esophagus in that segment. So what does that mean? So essentially it really is almost like having a rubber tube where I put part of that rubber tube in a pool of water. Let's just say for example that's a pool of water and I take that rubber tube and part of that tube is in the pool of water. The segment of the tube that is in the air has a lower pressure exerted around it than the segment of tube that is in the pool of water. And so what that does, that allows a higher pressure zone to exist at the lower esophagus and that is one mechanism at which we prevent reflux or your body prevents reflux naturally. The second mechanism, which has to do with pressure again, uh, has to do with, again, intact anatomy. Around the diaphragm, there's actually a row of muscles that we call the crura muscles. So you had the right cruise and the left cruise. And the right and left cruise of the muscles are essentially a, uh, a, a row of muscles that kind of look like a zipper. And through the zipper, the esophagus goes through it, and that muscle aligns, aligns itself to that segment of the esophagus, and the muscle itself exerts a direct pressure against that lower esophageal sphincter. And because of that, that is a second mechanism at which you increase the pressure around the lower esophagus. Now keep in mind, the actual physiology of lower esophageal sphincter um, uh, um, function it go, is a little bit more complex than that. But again, for today's lecture, I think it's very important to, to simplify the things and, and basically understand that the lower esophageal sphincter physiology is dependent upon pressures. Really not so much what we call the flat valve or so on and so forth that you may hear uh, you know, at other um, institutions. So in order to basically comprise or increase the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, you have to have intact anatomy. Now when a patient has a hiatal or hernia, what happens is that the hole in the diaphragm gets wider. And so now that hole gets bigger, and as law of physics dictates, pressure causes migration of structures from a high pressure to a low pressure. So there's a high pressure in the abdominal cavity and a lower pressure in the chest, 
or it's going to push things up into the chest cavity. So those patients with a hiatal hernia, they end up looking like this. So, this is the chest cavity, the diaphragm, the abdominal cavity, the diaphragmatic hiatus, which is now wider, and because it's widened, the stomach has been pushed up into the chest cavity. So what does that do? It displaces the lower esophageal sphincter into an environment that has a lower pressure. So again, as we discussed before, the abdomen has a higher pressure than the chest cavity, and that pressure gradient is what prevents the reflux from happening. Now, when you take the lower esophageal sphincter and you displace it and put it into an environment of lower pressure, you essentially equalize the pressure along the length of a tube. And because you, 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 you equalize that pressure around the length of a tube, it's very similar to having, for example, a cup of water. Anytime that cup of water gets pushed over, things go out of the top of the cup and it spills. And very similar here, if you have an equalization of pressure around a tube, reflux occurs primarily because of the fact that there is no pressure gradient to prevent the reflux from happening. The second mechanism at which we lose that pressure along the lower esophageal sphincter is that diaphragm now, that we discussed before, is no longer compressing against that lower segment of the esophagus. In fact, it's around the stomach. And because of that, we lose pressure at the lower esophagus, and that's the second mechanism at which we lose pressure around the lower esophagus, thereby a second mechanism by which people with hiatal hernias will always have regurgitation and reflux. Now those medications simply decrease the acidity of the stomach. And so what that means is that when the stomach acids come up, you just don't feel it anymore. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it is not coming up. And that's where it becomes extremely dangerous. There's definitely been studies which shown that, you know, acidity, the acid composition of the stomach is not what's directly responsible for causing Barrett's esophagus. And there's been well-developed studies which shown that what we call mixed reflux, where there's presence of bile coming from the liver, and mixes with the acid, thereby we call it mixed reflux, is what actually increases the risk of developing Barrett's esophagus or the known precancerous changes of the esophagus. So therefore, simply decreasing the acidity by taking medications doesn't truly stop or decrease the risk of developing esophageal cancer. Uh, and so because of that, it's very important to recognize, uh, in my opinion, that with a patient with hiatal hernia, reflux is going to happen, and simply decreasing the composition of the acid in the stomach does not stop the regurgitation. The reason why this becomes uh, extremely important is because of the fact that Besides the obvious potential risk for uh, development of esophageal cancer, simply decreasing the reflux rate, uh, simply decreasing the pH in the, in the stomach does not truly stop the regurgitation effects for causing chronic coughing, chronic asthma, um, uh, shortness of breath, voice changes. And in fact, up to 80% of, of adults with adult onset asthma, there is some relationship to reflux. Uh, as seen by many studies out there. So, you know, again, it's showing you that what reflux is, is more of a mechanical problem and not so much a chemical problem. So because of that, when I see my patients, those patients that truly have a hydro hernia, with true proof that there's reflux, as well as true proof that there's biophy proven changes in their esophagus because of chronic reflux, I recommend simply stopping the leak. So it's like I tell my patients, it really is, there's, there's several different examples to see this. But for example, if you have a valve in your car that constantly clicks uh, because it's broken, the last thing you want to hear from the mechanic is what type of oil they use to change you know, in your car to decrease the clicking sound of that valve. Very similarly, uh, it's almost like saying there's a fire going on and the fire alarm is very annoying, so I'm going to take the batteries out of the fire alarm so that way I don't hear that warning me of the fire anymore. So that's very similar sort of um, uh, examples of why you want to address the true nature of the disease 
rather than just addressing symptoms by masking the symptoms with medications. There are several surgical options which are designed to treat reflux definitively, and every surgery, of course, has potential complications. However, I do recommend that the most important thing to do is to get a full workup to truly determine if the reflux is caused by a hernia or a higher hernia mm -hmm. uh, rather than other functional disorders uh, with biopsies, with the proper studies, rather than continuing to just medicate without the proper workup. This is a known disease and affects a huge number of patients in America. Up to 30% of patients can actually have, actually have re, uh, significant reflux, causing significant lifestyle uh, changes and lifestyle uh, hindrances. Uh, but more importantly, esophageal cancer is a growing epidemic in this country. For the past 20 years, up to 600% increase in the incidence of esophageal cancer, and the numbers are staggering. So I think it's very important that anyone with reflux, that what I tell my patients is you want to educate. You don't only medicate. And again, there are medications that are truly the right thing to do for patients if they have reflux. But again, I do recommend that people with reflux get screened properly and worked up properly before we just continue to take those medications. Again, thank you for your time. I appreciate everyone uh, listening to me today. Everyone have a good day.